and um, Tim is going to talk about unknown identification and imaging mass spectrometry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rick, for uh, that this opportunity to talk and to talk about our research together. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about un unknown identification. So, really, if you know me, what I'm going to talk about a lot is what we do with mass spectra and how we can take the complexity of a imaging mass spectrum and understand what chemicals are there in terms of using tandem mass spectrometry. And the reason why that's important is because we need to know what they are in order to understand any etiology of any disease or path pathological differences between samples. So what I hope to bring with this talk is how the utility of tandem mass spectrometry is in that identification, as well as show you a, a clean example from a project that, from the beginning to the end, where unknown identification resulted in understanding how the chemicals distributed in the tissue relate back to the disorder. <clears throat> so first, I'd like to just go ahead and do acknowledgments to thank all the people involved, and of course, a lot of graduate student involvement. Uh, Whitney Stutz uh, is involved in a lot of oxidation lipid studies. I'm not going to talk a lot about that right now, but that's, she's taking that on. Uh, Rob Manger has done a lot of work in uh, cardiac tissues, and I uh, will talk a lot more a lot about that project. Um, Yushen is looking at a uh, combination of looking at lipids and peptides in muscle tissue. Uh, I won't be able to have, have time to talk about that today. And of course, missing from this, oh, there's Rick, and of course, missing from this is myself and William uh, Moundfield. William's involved in developing new matrix deposition techniques to improve our process and speed in deposition. And these are, of course, the funding, the funding agencies involved. And the only other person I'd like to acknowledge is a collaborator of mine who passed away during uh, our research together, who got me involved in doing eye research, and I'll talk about that project. His name is Bill Dawson. Uh, he was a great collaborator and um, wish we could have had a lot more time together. Uh, so I'm going to start with a mass spectrum. This is a single mass spectrum from a one spot, a 100 micron spot on tissue. And so this is only showing the 650 to 1,000 mass range. And this would basically be an example of what we would see from this region. This is the lipid region, as we know now. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of different compounds in here changing. So what we do is we isolate individual compounds using an ion trap, store that ion in the, in the trap, and, ice, and uh, activate it to produce product ion. And when we do that, we can isolate in individual species. So this doesn't have to be done across the tissue. This can be done at individual spots across the sample, collecting specific information about a product ion. And, and as you see, if you look at the green, we have one compound that is actually detected as three different species. We showed this uh, years ago, and just kind of highlights that a, a mass spectrum from tissue has lots of different ions present. And those ions we identify as potassiated minus part of the compound, so that's a source fragment that we see here, a sodiated ion, and a potassiated ion, as well as when we use MALDI, all of the work I'm going to talk about today is MALDI imaging, and Dieter did a, did a great job of showing the process of MALDI imaging, so I don't have to talk about that. Um, so when we apply the matrix, you actually see addicts with that matrix, and that adds complexity to the, to the sample because you're adding compounds that shouldn't be there be, because they form addicts. <clears throat> but we use tandem mass spectrometry to, to identify them. And MALDI, of course, won the Nobel Prize years ago because of its ability to do soft desorption of intact molecules. But when you look at the small molecule compartment, you actually see lots of small fragment ions that are produced in the source during the ionization process. And you see three of them here. One, this one, of course, is not, and I'll talk a little bit about the identification of that one. <clears throat> but once we do this tandem experiment, we can take the complexity of, it, of a mass spectrum and divulge out all the di different individual species. But it's not as simple as that because it is a direct analysis technique. Um, we're not doing any pre-separation pre of the sample by LCMS. And so when you actually look at a tandem mass spectrum, so this the full scan uh, product ion spectrum for mass to charge 828 is the, the larger spectrum. When you look at the 
these smaller, less abundant ions in the low region, we can actually differentiate them to different ions. And if we take a tandem mass spectrum scanning across the entire tissue section, so taking from one point, looking at only this ion distribution, what we get is tandem MS images. And so when we, when we draw out a specific ion, in this case, a 652 in the red, we get a distribution that shows it's outside of the tissue. Well, that tells us that that tissue and that sample is related to the matrix most likely and not related to the sample, except for maybe some spurious signals within the, within the tissue that could potentially relate to what, what that, something in the tissue besides just matrix. But we also see two other complementary images, one for the most abundant ion that shows a distribution in, this, in these regions of the brain versus this less abundant ion way down here, these two ion signals showing a distribution more in the white matter and lower portions of the brain. So that this is really the utility of what tandem mass spectrometry can do in taking one mass spectrum and showing that there's actually four different ions present at that single mass. And so when you do that across all the samples, you can get this kind of uh, table that shows you the different ions that you can detect from one single mass, as well as the different lipids. These are all lipids in this case, the different lipid species that we see. And you can also see one of the downfalls of MALDI is that you have a DHB ion at every single mass. They're really low abundant, but that's what happens when you have a matrix molecule. <clears throat> of course, you can do this with high resolution mass spectrometry as well. So if we look at a single mass, single mass unit from 8, 844 to 845, we can see that we have four different ions here detected at that single mass. And we can use that accurate mass to help, or the high resolution, to help create individual ion images for each of those different masses. So you can pull out these uh, um, very resolved, spa uh, mass spectrometrically resolved, and get spatially resolved images. So this is combining high resolution mass spectrometry with spatial localization and imaging mass spectrometry, a really nice utility of what you can do. And then when you do that, you get distributions throughout the spinal cord section. So this is just a 10 micron spinal cord section coated with dihydroxybenzoic acid. And we're at about 100 micron resolution here. And I uh, forget the resolution of what that is on this instrument. This is an Orbitrap. So it's 60,000 or so, I think. I can't remember the resolution. Uh, but because it's an Orbitrap, we still need to know what the identification of that compound is so we can isolate it and we can get product ion information like we did before with just the ion trap, but now get high resolution full scan images, unit mass resolution tandem MS images. And that's important that it's unit mass resolution here in that you're isolating this whole one AMU wide window rather than isolating a single highly resolved, mass spectrometrically resolved ion, which we can't do it with uh, any of our current instrumentation. But we can, by isolating it, differentiate each one of those ions based on the full scan ion images that you see here, in addition to now the tandem MS images that show how they break down and how those relate back to the parent ion. <clears throat> and this, of course, identifies uh, ceramides and, cere and cerebricides in this compound. So one of the projects that we have is looking at uh, macular degeneration. Um, this is a collaborator with Phil Dawson. Uh, and this is one of the um, number one causes of visual, visual loss in the elderly. Um, and what these hallmarks of this disease are these white spots that we see in this fundus image showing the, the localization in the, within the macula and these little white dots that you see here. So Bill approached us to see if it's possible to use mass spectrometry to delve into those small dots. The problem is those dots are less than 10 microns or 10 to 20 microns in size. So what we're really looking at with imaging are clumps of those dots together because we're only down to 100 micron resolution with our instrument. There are newer instruments out there with better uh, design optics to get smaller uh, spot sizes. But with what we do is 100 micron resolution. They're clear here in this image, but all this image shows you is that they autofluorescent. You get this dot in the eye. So if we take a um, take that set that eye, and the, of course the downside of imaging mass spectrometry is it's not you cannot look at the sample in vivo, and so this is actually what what we see in the eye. It's a flat mounted uh, segment of the eye that's petal shaped in order to get it flat on the tissue, 
And when we first started doing this, of course, it was really hard to get the sample to stay on the tissue, on the surface. They don't really adhere to metal very well, so we actually use nitrocellulose to, to put the sample on and then tape that nitrocellulose to the, to the microscope slide or adhere it in some way to get this flat image. This was the first, first and only one that stayed on the metal slide, so it shows the metal distribution in the back. And if we look at a full scan uh, MS image or a total ion image of that sample, we, we can see distributions throughout the tissue. If we focus in on this small area with the blue part, we can somewhat correlate this back to the eye. And this is, this is one of the hardest parts of imaging, especially with ocular tissues, is that you can't, we don't have a good way to correlate back from a fundus image to the flat mounted tennis and MS image. So what we have is this small cutaway that the, uh, the collaborator had put in there to, to recognize which part of the flat mount had the macular region on. And that's what we're looking at. And so we can hopefully localize the fovea region. And what we think is right here, we know that we have the optic nerve head because we've we put a hole there for the optic nerve head. We're not looking at the optic nerve head at all. And then we can pull out what we think would be a drusen corresponding to this arrow um, and look at a mass spectrum from that region compared to a mass spectrum in the fovea region. And that's really what utility of imaging has in that you can differentiate using high localization to differentiate different mass spectrometric images. And so with that, we can see we have a distribution of cholesterol that is still in both the fovea, but a little bit more increased in the drusen region as well as lots of lipids that are present in, those, in that, what we think is the drusen. And that's our, our, our hypothesis is that the cells are accumulating in the drusen, forming lipid deposits that are not really withdrawn from the sample enough. We need a lot more tissue to do this, and this is where we're looking, moving forward now with a different collaborator to kind of bring the project back. But it really resulted in other concepts of what else we should be seeing in the sample. Um, and so this highlights again what, what really imaging has in that you get high spatial resolution with even in a 100 micron sample. So this is an entire flat mount, and we get localization of specific compounds spread throughout the tissue, and that, that's lost in an LCMS experiment. <clears throat> and in some ways, because of the high localization, if you, if you don't do laser capture microdissection that Dieter talked about, um, and you try to dissect the whole tissue, you might lose that sample in the noise of the mass spectrum because it's highly localized, and thus the sensitivity might, might not be enough to bring it out. Hopefully not. <clears throat> so that's what we're not doing any separation except what Ron talked about, which is ion mobility post-separation uh, after ionization. And of course, we see lots of different compounds, lipids, peptides, metabolites, and, uh, and exogenous compounds from a sample. <clears throat> and so only when you, when you just move off the sample, you get away from this species, which, which this is a uh, triacylglyceride. So this is basically what we think are fatty deposits in the eye. Of course, we're, we're working more on looking at how those fats relate to diseases, uh, but this was seen in an, in an elderly sample, and so with more tissues, we'll be able to lo localize that. It also says that we can use, not just looking at drusen, but we can use the same sample to look at other aspects of vision or of distribution in the tissue. But what this really led to, to me, and I'm looking at mass spectrum a lot from tissues, is that when you look at a primate sample, we have a very clean mass spectrum that we know when we look at compounds, we see what we normally see in lots of different tissues. When we look at something that's from a donor, and in, in a lot of the samples that we use, we need donor tissue because the donors um, help us to get a, a lot of numbers and see what's happening. But the problem is, is that we don't necessarily know a lot about the sample beforehand. So when we looked at this first sample, uh, we see, or I, I detected compounds that were not present in, a, in our primate samples. <clears throat> and a, being a mass spectrometrist and having an ion trap gave the, the concept of, well, let's do a tandem mass spectrometry and figure out what they are. <clears throat> and so when you look at the mass spectrum, we have closer, we have these three, these three compounds separated by masses. And those masses might, may or may not be important. But that's, this is what really what mass spectrometry has, is we have um, Combinations of masses that make sense. Differences of 28 typically have CH2, dif differences of, C of ethylene. Or <clears throat> so that would indicate of a fatty acid. 
And so if we look at an MSMS, the, if we look at the distributions of all of those related compounds, and there's another one at 388 that also is uh, related by 28, we get a distribution that's similar. But similar distributions don't mean that they're related at all. And so how do we relate those back? Well, we look at tandem mass spectrometry. So if we do MSMS of 304, we get a, actually a pretty beautiful product ion image, um, except it only really gives us half the molecule. So we get compounds that relate to potentially a long chain, and as well as the most, most unique one, which is 91. And that, if you're familiar with EI, electron ionization mass spectrometry, this is the tropilium ion, which is very common, so it's very unique, and in if in, in a mass spectrometrist, that sticks right out. <clears throat> and so we know it has to have that phenyl group. We can do MS to the third, so this is an example of that. And when we do that, we see that we have um, what looks like a fatty acid chain breakdown, very common fatty acid chain breakdown. Um, and we can do exact mass on an LCMX extract or on this tissue sample itself, but in this case, it really wasn't that useful because there was lots of different combinations that produced that, and in fact, this compound wasn't in the databases that we searched. <clears throat> so the, really, the, the one thing that helped, and this is not to be trivial, but the search engine, Google, uh, and, and image searching for a specific mass is actually very, um, produces a lot of interesting information. When you look, it, it filter through different journals and different articles that have, have produced mass spectra that shows a specific mass. And so that's what this brought to is this article that uh, was published in 1998 about using, looking at antibacterials and looking at benzalkonium, benzalkonium ammonium salts or benzo, benzalkonium chlorides. And it has a phenyl ring, so that's key, saying something like it has a chain that's changing uh, in different lengths. And, it ha and this MSMS -MS spectrum isn't that clean in terms of comparison to ours because it's a different instrument. But um, what we can do is use that information and do an extract. So we scraped off the tissue from the, the sample and um, submitted it to LCMS of an eye extract, took a sample of Visine, which has benzoconium chloride in it. That was the quickest way to get a standard and reference that to a standard. And we get a very similar LCMS example with a little bit of a shift in retention, which we think is from lipids. And so the problem is, is we know that that's BIC, but we don't know why it's there. Um, and of course, it, it had a distribution that would be similar to dropping uh, an eye drop in your eye because it's out in the outer periphery of the, of the eye. Um, but after finally tracking down the, the person who prepared the sample, we find out how they actually prepare the samples is by dipping the cornea into this solution that has benzoconium chloride in it. They use the cornea for organ transplantations. And so this is why we get the rest, the other part of the tissue. And so what happens as they dip it in there is it spreads into the tissue and we get our distribution of benzoconium chloride on the, on the outer periphery. So that's good in that we, we were able to use basically forensics and figure out what, the, what was that compound, but it's bad because in some ways BACs will suppress endogenous species, so that means you can't. These kinds of tissues won't, won't be as useful as other ones without BAC. And of course, we, as Ron had mentioned at the beginning, we have to have everyone involved in the process of making an image understand what we get out in the end, because without that, we have the presence of compounds that we don't know how they got there. And we really don't want to have that happen too many times because it, it's frustrating, um, but that's the way it is. And of course, we still have some areas that don't ex aren't explained by that, uh, which could be just a drop of the sample from the preparation. So the other compound I talked about earlier is this 672 that um, I'll just briefly mention in that it, we can do MSMS and we get this loss of 59. And that, as a lipid person, that tells me immediately that this is a phosphatidylcholine. Um, and so we don't need to do that MS. We don't need as much information from MSMS, so we use MS to the third and get breakdown product ions. And so the problem with this particular compound is that these two ions, which relate to the fatty acid tails, actually relate to two different potential product ions. And since this is a low resolution instrument with, with, without high mass accuracy, this actually can be related to two different lipids. One could be PC260, 10 0 or a oxidized aldehyde of the same compound. And that's why this ion would tell us that. Uh, we have exact mass from the brain, which suggests that it's the aldehyde, but we're working on getting exact mass from the tissue to know that this is exactly what that is. Exact mass on its own may or may not pick up that 
that it's an oxidized species. So with this, we can localize it, break it down, and look at what, what the breakdown looks like in terms of product ions. Um, and then we can hopefully relate that back. The problem for me is that these ions should not be the same abundance. And so we really need a standard to, to relate that back to, to whether it's an aldehyde or not. And this is where Whitney Stutz in the lab is working on um, developing standards to compare oxidized lipids in terms of MSMS patterns that we see and, and ensure that we're actually looking at an oxidized lipid and not something that's just a short chain fatty acid lipid. <clears throat> All right, so at the end of this, I'm going to go through a project that kind of relates all this back together, and this is looking at biomarkers of myocardial infarction. Um, and so you can, you can get different, as we talked about, you can look at different metabolites, lysolipids, triglycerides, um, and this would be the example of a heart that's stained. We're showing the area of infarction. So um, the blood-borne biomarkers of, of myocardial, myocardial infarction, MI for short, are troponins, which are elevated at 4 to 10 days, um, and they're involved in cardiac muscle contraction with their molecular weights, which are not accessible on our instrument just because it's a uh, low-mass instrument. Creatine, ki creatine kinase, another protein that has a molecular weight of 42,000 that catalyzes the conversion of creatine, something we can look at, into phosphocreatine. Um, and so while we can't look at this, we potentially could look at creatine. And so the goal of this project really is to identify the biomarkers in tissue that are related to an infarcted zone. So how is this done? The rat is administered uh, an RA ligation to, to produce this uh, infarcted area. We take a section across that and get this tissue section that shows that infarction plane with the, whole, the rest of the cardiac tissue. Uh, these are actually 20 micron thick sections, and these are distributions within those samples. <clears throat> So this is the, the reaction of creatine to phosphocreatine using catal the catalyst, or the enzyme, sorry, uh, creatine kinase uh, and ATP. And so this is released into the bloodstream following MI, as I said. <clears throat> and so we can't look at the protein, but creatine is well within the mass range. So the, our question is, is, does the concentration of creatine in the tissue change after myocardial infarction? And if we look at, at the full scan, we can see that the mass to charge 132, the expected ion signal for creatine, is showing little distribution in the infarcted area while showing a lot of distribution in the rest of the tissue. And if, to confirm this, you can use MSMS, so isolate 132, and look at a single transition to 90 to look at that same distribution, which, kind of, which confirms the full scan. So this tells us two things. One low mass resolution is, a, is sufficient for this experiment in that we can see even at 132 that change is going up and we can confirm that with MSMS. Of course, the, the distribution is, would be better with high resolution, but this, isn't, this is um, not a, a mass region that's typically looked at with MALDI. MALDI's highly focused on looking at proteins and, and higher molecular weight lipids because at these low masses, you're really in the, the mess of matrix that you get from the tissue. But in some cases, because we're at a different pressure with the instrument we use, we don't see as many matrix species that are really dominant, and so these small molecular weight markers are accessible to looking at what's changing in those. <clears throat> so that validates what we can do, that we can do this in tissue. Um, and then the other utility of imaging is that it's untargeted, as had been mentioned previously. So there's lots of different opportunities to look at what else is changing in the tissue. So we can look at lipids, and we can look at the infarcted tissue, uh, versus compared to the healthy tissue. And so we see lysolipids versus intact lipids. Lysolipids are an a enzymatic product of an intact phospholipid. If we look at the healthy tissue, we don't see as many lysolipids in that region uh, in comparison to, to the, the, the phospholipid signature that I talked about earlier. And of course, phospholipase A is linked to myocardial infarction in that its activity is increased. <laughs> <clears throat> so if we look at what happens, we get a PC compound, phosphatidylcholine, with this fatty acid arrangement, uh -uh, and phospholipase A2 cleaves specifically here, producing both oleic acid and LPC-16-0. Uh -uh. And so these two, these two products, then, we can at least look at one of them and then potentially look for the other one down the road. So if we look at the distribution after the MI, 
we can see that LPE 18.0 lyso lysophosphatidyl ethanolamine 18.0 is highly localized in the, in the MI region, as well as uh, the lysophosphatidylcholine 18.0, and LPC 16.0. While we look at the full tissue, the the um, precursor, we can see that distribution is more intense in the other areas and starting to diminish in that myocardial infarction area. Of course, we really need to confirm that this is what it is, so we use MS squared to identify that this is actually LPC 18.0, uh, and we can look at the full scan divided by the total ion current, which is common done, commonly done with uh, MS images, and then we can look at tandem mass spectrometry to show that it's very highly localized in that myocardial infarcted area. And so to, to tie all these together, we can use what Ron had talked about in terms of looking at principal components analysis to look at the statistics and look at what's changing in the sample with these, with these, uh, this particular uh, experiment. And so when we do that, we can average, or we average, in, instead of using multiple different tissues, we use one tissue because of the ability, because the infarcted area is so highly localized, we can use the tissue sample as its own control because the, the area of the tissue that's not um, part of the infarcted area will be unchanged, ideally, unless the infarction area is very high. So we choose a, an area that's very far away from that, and we look at five samples per region as a representative sample to do uh, processing. And then we use a, the free program metabolic analyst online to do that differentiation and do PL, PCA. And when we do that, we see very good grouping between that, those healthy samples and the infarcted area in both PCA and PLS. <clears throat> Uh, that confirms both of them. And then we can look at how those load onto the original mass to charge values, which is what Ron showed, which is a very, this is really the, the highly, you, you, the most important part of drawing this kind of PCA is looking at really what's changing. So if we look at um, the healthy versus the infarcted, the, the infarcted region show an increase of not just lysolipids, but sphingomyelin, cholesterol, and the sphingosine base, which sphingomyelin and these are related. Uh, cholesterol, of course, is a cellular marker. Uh, and we see the healthy tissue, we get PL, pro these are fragments from the source, as well as intact PCs, and we get a similar result using PLS. <clears throat> uh, so we can then look at individual fatty acids and look at how fatty acids may be related to infarction. And what this shows us is that fatty acid, arachidonic acid, seems to be much more affected than others. Why would that be the case? Well, arachidonic acid is much more oxidized easily oxidized than other lipids because of the double bonds that are present in the fatty acid tail. <clears throat> so that relates back to, to understanding how we can look at oxidized lipids and then go back and see, do we see oxidative products of DHA present here that we, had, that we haven't seen before and go back and look at the tissue with those experiments that Whitney's doing. <clears throat> So, in summary, what I hope I've done is show you really the utility of tandem mass spectrometry in this process and how tandem mass spectrometry relates back to looking at distribution in tissue. So we're looking at a tissue sample that's highly localized, if, if it's highly localized, and we're using tandem mass spectrometry to, to pull out that distribution. A, a one part of this that we haven't mentioned is now can we de develop a program, a software that's immediately response to do a data-dependent experiment that then pulls out those differences right away and then feeds back into the sample to say, do MSMS on these areas and, and get, gather that information and dump it into the same data folder um, to move forward. You do data-dependent experiments on protein, protein analysis and metabolomics and, and LCMS, so we can do the same thing here. It's just a longer time experiment, but it doesn't matter if the sample's in the, already in the vacuum chamber and it takes just a few more minutes to do that processing. The key here is that um, identification of compounds really leads to an understanding of biochemistry. And that intact, in that one project that showed, intact phospholipids create lysolipids that help to understand what's happening in that tissue and validate the original model, as well as look for potential oxidation products. What we didn't show is that can we then find, use that tissue experiment to find a biomarker in plasma before the infarction happens or, or afterwards, or looking at how the tissue is repairing itself 
by, by understanding the chemistry associated with these products that are produced. And I, I kind of talk about this a lot when I talk with people <laughs> in the group, is that some of the databases that we have aren't as useful for imaging data. And the reason is because we get, we, we've localized samples and we've localized different compounds to different tissues, but the databases are really focused on plasma samples and, and, or tissue extracts. So what we really need to do is start thinking about how we can combine databases that, that looked at samples that are not separated in space to databases that are now separated in space that we can get information and combine these into a, a, real, a smarter database that helps us identify compounds. And I, I mentioned Google before as a simple way to search. It, it's a lot more useful than, than it seems, and it can, it can find information a lot faster than I had in any other, any other sample. Uh, I use, uh, pretty much if I have an unknown compound, I look for it <laughs> that way. Uh, just to kind of tie papers together. It's a, a very rapid way to tie other published papers, really, together um, and look at how your compound relates. Now, in the end, you have to make the, the uh, validation experiment and do the tandem mass spectrometry to understand, or high-resolution mass spectrometry, to understand what's happening in the tissue. <clears throat> and with that, I'd also like to thank you for your time, and uh, I'm ready for any questions. <laughs>